because there's no one correct in different platform, it's roughly we're going to have to be So the next session will be our students' leaders talk. It will be given by all of our students, uh, student, our great students, and one uh, undergraduate student. So um, we'll start from uh, Leah Potter, uh, she's a graduate student um, in chemistry, and then followed by Harry Bandari, uh, then Hannah uh, Bode, and then Mohammed Ergaba. Yeah, uh, you're ready to start. Thank you. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nia Pollard. I'm currently a fourth year PhD student here at George Mason University. I'm a member of the Claiborne Research Group, um, where I investigate gold nanoparticles using both classical and quantum computational methods. And today the title of my talk is Investigating Catalysis on Gold Nanoparticles Using Multi-Scale Quantum Approaches. So since this is a shorter talk today, um, I kind of condensed everything into this one slide, but definitely feel free to reach out to me afterwards if you guys have any questions or want me to go into further detail. I wanna start by mentioning some of the motivations that we had for this project. Um, we decided to look at two molecules that play a very significant role in environmental remediation, carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide. We focused primarily on nitrogen monoxide or NO for the beginning of this project because nitrogen containing molecules also play a key role in the Haber cycle, which is key to the production of fertilizer. The Haber cycle is a costly, time consuming and potentially dangerous process since it requires extremely high temperatures and pressures. Improvements to that process could potentially boost global agricultural output significantly. I also would like to touch on why we decided to use gold nanoparticles for this project. Although gold was originally thought to be chemically inert, scientists discovered that gold exhibits chemical activity at the nanoscale. Almost 30 years ago, a scientist named Haruta observed a low temperature oxidation of carbon monoxide with oxide supported gold nanoparticles. And since then, several studies have illustrated that gold can oxidize and reduce a variety of molecules. While catalysis on gold nanoparticles has been studied computationally before, little to no work exists on using quantum computing to study the reactivity of these systems. Also, classical computing can sometimes be inaccurate and inefficient. Because of this, we decided to employ quantum DFT embedding to test the catalytic effect of gold nanoparticles more efficiently and more accurately. In short, quantum DFT embedding is a hybrid classical quantum method that aims at modeling larger systems by combining classical and quantum computing. Um, so here is my overall research approach for the project. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go over each step, but this project is still in the beginning stages. So, so far I've done a lot on this first step, which are the DFT calculations or the classical calculations. These calculations are a precursor to my future work, which I'll be doing, where I'll be doing the quantum computing. I've studied three different systems, which I showed you on this first slide. Um, and most interestingly, I found that this gold 13 system um, would be considered to be a successful catalyst for NO reduction. Here's a quick video that shows you how the DFT calculation, how the bond breaks during the DFT calculation. It's a little bit fast, so I looped it so you can definitely catch it. But the important thing to note here is the fact that that bond is breaking and therefore um, gold 13 would be considered successful as a catalyst. The next step in this process, which is where I am now, is to analyze the active orbitals of the system. Active orbitals can be described as orbitals that undergo the most change when a cluster interacts with, oxidizes, or reduces the studied molecule. In the case of gold 13, we'll start by analyzing the orbitals of this gold atom that's connected to the nitrogen, the nitrogen atom, and the oxygen atom. Each of these active orbitals will, rep will represent a state on the quantum computer. After this step, um, we'll, model, we'll model these active orbitals on IBM's open source library for quantum computing called Qiskit. We'll be using the variational quantum eigensolver or the VQE, which is a commonly used algorithm for solving chemical problems. Here's a good example of a schematic circuit diagram of the VQE that I found in literature. Each active orbital will be modeled by a qubit. Um, these qubits will be um, manipulated by a sequence of operators and then a measurement is taken. That result can be used to initialize the classical calculation, and this process is then repeated until convergence is reached. 
So just to reiterate what I mentioned today, um, so far we found that one of the studied systems, Gold 13, was successful as a catalyst, and therefore we will be analyzing this system on the quantum computer. We hope to repeat this process with carbon monoxide and also test other 13 atom metal clusters. This project also opens up a potential for collaboration with experimental groups. This research is very exciting and in my opinion, very promising. This project act as a proof of concept study that shows how quantum DFT embedding can be used for larger systems such as gold nanoparticles. It will also give us insight into the efficiency of gold nanoparticles as catalysts. Unfortunately, I couldn't go into too much detail today, but definitely feel free to reach out to me if you guys have any questions. And a brief thank you to everyone that's here, uh, my advisor and my advisors at IBM. And of course, thank you to QSEC. Yeah. Uh, we probably have no time for questions, but uh, also I just have contact. You. We do have a contact that's in the uh, Thank you, Nia, again. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hari Bandari. I'm a graduate student and I'm working with Dr. Imre as my research supervisor. Today, I will talk uh, briefly about some of my data in which we were able to tune magnetism in one of the 166 compounds by germanium doping. So, now, uh, this is the Swiss culture of 166 compound yttrium magnesium 66. Dr. Gimbe has already explained about the crystal structure of this compound, which has a very interesting crystal structure. And this is a magnetic phase diagram. Of so this is the magnetic phase diagram for this compound. It has a very rich magnetic phase diagram where we can see uh, at least four different phases. And from the susceptibility plot, we can see the magnetic transition is actually 43 Kelvin. Now let us look. Now let us look at the magnetic phases of uh, this. Uh, sorry. Okay, now uh, this represents the magnetic structure of these different phases, and this arrow represents the direction of spin in the magnetic. Uh, layers which Dr. Gimbe talked earlier. And among these, the fan, fan like phase is more interesting. So, this is showing the projection of fan like phase into the AV plane. It has two components. X component refers to the component of the spins in the direction of magnetic field, and perpendicular component refers to the component of the spins perpendicular to magnetic field in the AV plane. So, if we look at layer two and layer three, so these layers refers to the magnetic layers formed by magnet atoms. So if we look between layer two and three, the change of angle made by the spins while going from layer two to layer three is large in the fan-like phase as compared to the TCS phase. So the electron hopping from layer two to layer three is difficult. And due to this structure, we can expect to see an increase in magnetic resistance, which we have seen in our data as shown here in this figure. So here, black curve indicates magnetization 
and red curve indicates magneto resistance for current applied on C axis, and blue curve indicates magneto resistance for current applied on AB plane. So, if we look at the blue curve, we can see a very negligible change in magneto resistance. This is because electrons can easily flow along this direction. And if we look at the red curve, we can see an increase in magneto resistance here just before it enters into the fan like phase. This is because of the reduction of hopping, as I explained earlier. And we can see a drop here. This is due to a leftist transition, which I'm not going to talk here. Now let us look back into the crystal structure and the magnetic structure of this compound is due to the exchange interactions between the manganese layers, which is as shown by the black layers, black atoms layer one, two, and three. And the size of germanium is smaller than the size of tin. And when we drop germanium, then it shrinks the crystal structure and these exchange interaction changes. And we can tune the magnetism of the parent compound, iridium magnet 16 -6. Now here we can see crystals grow very nice and beautiful. Beautiful, these crystals were grown by using uh, flux method in which steel was used as a flux. And uh, this is showing a refined plot from X-ray diffraction data. And the manganese layers are separated by distinct drops. If we look at layer, in between layer one and two, it consists of blue atoms. So this is the tin atoms. And if we look between layer two and three, it consists of iridium and tin atoms. So now if we start putting germanium, then germanium replaces all the thin atoms only from this layer. And then we get this particular composition. Now, this is a comparison of magnetic phase diagram for the parent compound and doped compound. In the parent compound, we can see many phases. The phases are differentiated by the dotted lines. And for the doped compound, we can see three distinct phases as shown here. Now, the question is, what is this phase? So looking at these two phase diagram, it looks like this is TCS phase, but we can't tell that this is TCS phase on the basis of this comparison. Uh, now let us look at the magnetization and magneto resistance for the parent compound and the doped compound. So looking at the, uh, so the, here black curve indicates the magnetization and red curve indicates magneto resistance for current applied along C axis. And in the magnetization of the parent compound, we see a big jump here and then it increases linearly, and then here we can see a cost-like feature. Now, let us compare this with the doped compound. We see a similar big change in magnetization here, and then we can see a cost-like feature, and then we see a saturation. So looking at this, this two magnetization, it looks like there is a transition from this phase to this phase. In the doped compound, where it looks like this phase indicated here is eliminated. So the, another reason to bleed is by comparison of the magneto resistance. So if we look at this point where there is a big jump in magnetization, there is very negligible change in magneto resistance. If we look, look at the dope, dope compound in the magnetization where there is big jump, we see an increase in magneto resistance here. So this increase seen here is similar to the rise in magneto resistance seen here. So from these two comparisons, we can say that Germanium doping tunes the magnetism of the parent compound, iridium magnet 66. And it looks like the fan like phase is stabilized after this transition, but we are still studying this. So, here are my conclusions. And uh, we already have done Newton diffraction experiment for uh, this uh, sample, and we are analyzing our data. And Dr. Mahalin is doing theoretical calculations for us. Thank you.
So, hello everyone, my name is Connor. Um, this is a project I was working on with um, Jacob Ringlot, who's a uh, grad student at UMD, and Bell, who's a, working at, at oh, speak up. Um, Andrew Bladell, who's working at a Photonic, which is a company based off of and, um, Oh, I was need to share screen. Okay, I'll wait until, well, I can, I can keep introducing. Who's um, working at a company based in Vancouver, and uh, Professor Jarrett is right in the back here. Um, and uh, I'll wait until the screen is fully shared and um, before I keep going. But uh, no, mine's the uh, deck. Yeah, that one. Great. And um, well, I guess first off, I'll start with notation. This is a pretty intimidating slide, but there's not really all that much here. Um, so we're dealing with a time-dependent Hamiltonian and we're trying to think about like the evolution of states under that. Um, so we have a Hamiltonian which is depending on the parameter S, which is, I guess the way to think about it is time, but de-dimensionalized. So we're taking time and dividing it by some uh, parameter T, big T, which is the time scale. Um, it has these uh, eigenvectors and these eigenvalues um, just ordered in that way. Uh, notice that there's a gap between uh, the ground state and the next state. Um, this gap is called gamma, and I'm just here some citation to the minimum of that gap over some interval. Um, we have this unitary, which is like the time evolution of the system, uh, test by Schrodinger's equation. Um, obviously, when you're evolving from one time to the same time, it's going to be identity. Uh, here's where the time scale of T comes in. Um, and so that's a big part of what we're doing. And then we also have um, these two subspaces. S and we have gotten the complement of S, uh, which get its dimensions here, and we have the vector conjugate. We can think about the Hamiltonian where it's projected, like restricted to the subspace S. Um, that is still a it's still a permission, so it also has um I can tell I can tell in order like this. We're assuming that also has a the gap original the same the same thing. Um, so that's all the background notation. Uh, now let's we'll start talking about the adiabatic theorem. It's fairly um, there's a lot of ways of, of, of presenting the adiabatic theorem. For our purposes, what we're saying is that when you evolve the ground state at one time to another, it is, it is increasingly close to the ground state at the time you're evolving it to uh, as you increase the time scale. So uh, this allows for adiabatic quantum computation. The way it does that is that essentially when you start in the Hamiltonian that's really easy to implement the ground state for, and then you slowly interpolate into a problem relevant Hamiltonian, where, like, I don't know. Maybe the Hamiltonian is based on some cost function, and you're trying to maximize it. If you keep the ball slow enough, you'll get to that ground state, which will be the answer to some sort of problem that you want. Um, and so we're trying to investigate um, a region that is a little different from that when t is slow enough. We're trying to think about it on an intermediate time scale. Because that's when t is large. We want to think about it a little bit less than that. The reason we're doing that is because um, there's been some interest in diabatic annealing recently, which is where it's not adiabatic, which means the t is not that large. And so the way we're going to approach that is we're going to make use of the Cheater constant. So we've introduced s and s bar a while ago. And we want to think about how do we characterize flow like as time goes on. If you start in a state localized to s, how does that kind of flow out? Specifically, we're thinking if you start in a low energy state localized to s. So the intuitive idea is that we're going to make use of some basic graph theory um, called the Cheater constant. Which, um, again, we're taking the ground state, we're taking the part of the ground state on S, we're seeing what the Hamiltonian, the absolute value of all the terms in the Hamiltonian does is it like you know, shunts it over, and then we're taking the overlap of that with the component of the ground state on the um, S bar. And so the cool thing about this constant is that it also kind of relates to the, to the spectral gap, which is going to back some uh, spectral graph. So first off, we have that the uh, 
sometimes the shear constant bounds the point of the gap, sorry. And then if H is still plastic, which means that if um, all the off diagonal terms of H are non non positive, then you can bound it from below with a function of H of S and S on this um, number Q, which is related to you know, the Hamiltonian. So the intuition is that what do we do if this is really small? What, like, what happens when this essentially in the lower energy space is, is block diagonal? So intuitively, what we would think is that. Well, first off, that the evolution is going to be approximately block diagonal, right? And so the ground state we can show is approximately in the span of the ground state of the um, Hamiltonian restricted to S and the rest of the Hamiltonian restricted to R. So we want to think about the time evolution of this ground state under this approximately block diagonal thing. And so that leads us to kind of formalizing this idea of kind of the problem we're trying to prove. And so that problem is if you have the ground state of this localized Hamiltonian and you evolve it from time s to to s, you pair it with the localized ground state at s. We're trying to say that there are two terms that come in kind of here. There's the local adiabatic, so the adiabatic if we're just considering the evolution from that block diagonal term. And then there's also the flow, kind of the interference, which is characterized by the um, Cheater constant. And so the way this kind of the reason this becomes kind of an intermediate time scale adiabatic is first we can show that um, lambda, like the whole ground state, is like some close to some superposition of this and that lambda s bar. Then we can kind of we have two scalings. We have the one over t scaling and we have the t scaling, and we can balance those out to in some regimes get a better bound than the normal adiabatic term, but only when t is. Lower is, is less, right? It, it's, it's a very different kind of regime. And so that's all I have for now. Um, I think I don't think I went over time. Thanks for listening. I don't think we have time for questions, but if you're here. Yeah. 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 I'm an undergraduate researcher working under Dr. Um, today I'd like to talk about my project, which is on the synthesis of magnetic study of gallium gold 96 tensors. So the field of spintronics attempts to utilize the spin of electrons to process information rather than their charge, as our current electronic devices do. So such spin-based based methods will allow for faster, thinner, and more energy-efficient devices. And an important aspect of achieving this goal is the manipulation of spins. So I decided to study Thulium magnetic 6 Tin 6 because it hosts a very unique magnetic structure, which allows for, uh, which shows potential of uh, manipulation through doping. So this is the crystal structure of Thulium magnetic 6 Tin 6, where the green spheres are Thulium, the black are magnets, and the rest are thin. So <clears throat> the magnets and the Thulium atoms are responsible for the magnetism in the structure, and they form layers going along the C-axis. So through gallium doping, we'll be able to replace the tin atoms in this particular layer. And due to their difference in sizes, the magnetic interaction between the layers will change. So our goal is then to, uh, to create a composition which allows for manipulate, uh, spin manipulation with minimal uh, current density. So to grow my crystals, I use the tin plus method where I put all my elements into a crucible, and then they're put through a series of changes in temperature. 
And this uh, this uh, reaction took place in a furnace shown in this picture. So tin allows thulium, manganese, and gallium to melt below their melting points, and a solution can form. Then, then dropping the temperature oversaturates the solution, and crystals can form as you can see here. So this is a crystallized rose as a result of this process. As you can see, the hexagonal face is very nice and cool. So the compositions I drew are shown in this table. And I was able to extract this data through X-ray uh, diffraction uh, measurements. So figure A shows the plots of each of my compositions. As you can see, there's very minimal change, showing that the structure doesn't change as we increase the value of local. And in figure B, you see that um, this is data that we find uh, for X equals one using uh, full proxy analysis. And then um, what we would like to understand is that when we substitute gallium, uh, when we substitute tin with gallium, since gallium atoms are smaller, we expect the structure to, to shrink. And that's exactly what we see in this plot here. So this is the uh, lattice parameter A, and this is the lattice parameter C, and they're plotted against the gallium concentration. So these are reference uh, to the structure. So as we increase the gallium concentration, we see exactly what we expect. So the, the last parameter is C in red and A in black actually decrease the increase from the uh, concentration. So after learning about my, my compositions, and uh, I then moved on to measuring the magnetic properties. So this is a plot showing the temperature dependence of the magnetic moment with 0.1 tesla of magnetic field applied. So the black curve is showing my measurements while the magnetic field is applied along the AB frame. And the red curve is showing my measurements while um, the magnetic field is applied along the C-axis. So as you can see for the parent compound, we have multiple transitions. However, once we dip it, so once we dip it in just an X to 0.2 of gallium, we see that the behavior completely changes. Instead, we have a very broad, relatively constant moment along the AB frame. With increased gallium doping, of x equals 1.2, we now see that this behavior is completely irradiated. So the key thing to notice with these two plots is that the moments along the A plane are continuously larger than the moments along the C-axis. However, now below a certain temperature of around 210 Kelvin, the moments are along the C-axis are actually greater than the moments along the A plane. And when we increase the temperature, the spins reorient from along the C-axis to along the A plane. This behavior is also seen with increased gallium concentration of x equals 1.7. So these results uh, give us confidence uh, that we've been able to manipulate the spirals in the parent compound. So there are many more interesting properties which remain unknown. However, through Hall effect measurements and calculations which are currently in progress, we'll be able to understand more about the magnetism. Finally, neutron diffraction experiments will resolve the magnetic structure. Thank you very much for listening.